Hello, my name is Keith O'Byrne. I'm Director of Solutions for Azavi. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the plumbing of the Internet of Things and um, how do we securely create large scale networks um, and try to avoid some of the pitfalls. Um, I've titled my talk on the things and um, subtitled, This is not the Internet you're looking for. So, a little bit of an introduction to myself. I've been working in what used to be called SCATA, uh, and then it was M2M, and now it is apparently called IoT. I guess we can thank our marketing people for that. But broadly speaking, this is how do we connect and instrument the world around us. Um, we've probably all been to many talks that tell you about how there's going to be billions of devices by next Thursday. This isn't one of those talks. I'm more interested in talking a little bit about how do we build the plumbing? Um, my background is networks and security, design, PKI, and my first things network a long time ago was a network of bank machines. So I have, I have some kind of practical experience of connecting large numbers of mission critical or um, financial or life and limb uh, aspect devices. The organization I work with is Azavi Technologies, um, founded in 2004, we're about 125 people. Uh, our headquarters are in Dublin, where I'm joining you today. So uh, good afternoon for anybody in Europe and good morning for anybody on the West Coast. Broadly speaking, we are a software-defined networking company. And we take the principles of declaring networks, the, the replacement of physical kit with software to make it more malleable and more controllable. So we've 125 people, uh, about 85, uh, mostly engineering in Dublin, uh, where we also have our own microbrewery in-house. So if any of you are ever in Dublin, please stop by and say hello. So defining the problem, um, it's our belief that IoT has a baked in architectural challenge. Um, when we talk about the Internet of Things, we, we, we don't see the problem as being the things, we see the problem as being the Internet. The internet started out as a, an IPv4 any to any network um, and it's morphed to the point where for most people the internet means the world wide web and in fact for many people the internet means Facebook. Um, ISPs get away with providing a, a proxy server to the internet rather than a public routable v4 network. It's come full circle. Uh, the, the Internet of Humans is now a, a global cash picture distribution network. IPv6 is not necessarily going to fix this. And this is not a problem if what you want to do is connect as many 15 year olds with iPhones to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's a significant challenge for security and network architects who are trying to connect long lived constrained devices at scale. And that's kind of the problem space that Azavi, that Azavi works on today. And to put it in pictures, we started out with something called Arpanet, and we wound up with this hodgepodge of these that often seem to be designed to support themselves. And ultimately, it's about distributing funny pictures of cats. I think that's the only funny cat picture in the presentation. I, I can't be certain. So moving on and um, to find that problem a little bit more, uh, we have an internet of screens. We have largely high bit rate, largely unmetered bearers. And this really, really matters if you take a, a laptop that needs a new OpenSSL patch and um, it can be distributed fairly trivially. And um, that's not to, to, to make it sound easy, but there is infrastructure in place to push updates to human interface devices. We very seldom have to worry about the power consumption. And by power, I mean electricity. Um, very few devices um, in the Internet of Humans go without being charged uh, every 24 hours at least. Power consumption is secondary. CPU, storage, um, a source of entropy if you want to generate a key, uh, a, a TPM or a secure enclave on a device is usually a given. Humans notice when things get slow, uh, they'll reboot their machine, they'll bring it to IT. Uh, we saw with the Dyn DNS attacks that a camera can be running uh, botnet or malicious code 
for a very, very long time. And it won't necessarily be impacted by its, um, by its poor performance. As long as it can still do the, the background task it needs to do, people won't notice. And the last one, device lifecycle. Um, very few people keep a cell phone or a laptop more than 36 months, particularly in business or enterprise. So it's okay to drop or deprecate support for devices that are beyond a certain age. Um, and that it's not a complete capturing of the typifies the Internet of Humans, but it's, 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 it's a pretty good list. Um, in IoT, we have pretty much the exact opposite. Um, every byte to and from a device is metered. Um, regression testing of patches is hard. Uh, you can't always assume that a, an IoT node or endpoint is, is on a stable power supply or you have, you have power to spend on generating new keys. Devices are typically called constrained. Um, it could be a 16-bit or a 32-bit microcontroller. It may be a Quark or Atom or i3-based gateway, but we still have to be more careful with the, the way we spend our compute and our storage. IoT devices often don't have a human who will spot misbehavior. And the OT, and you'll all be familiar with this, um, the information technology world versus the operational technology world. And um, some of you will come from OT backgrounds and you'll understand that the lifespan of investment, the return on investment is a very, very different world. If I spend a lot of money on equipping lifts or elevators or pumps or humidity and ventilation, air conditioning systems with instrumentation, I expect that technology investment to last me a minimum of five and more likely 10 or 15 years. And lifespans in the 20 to 25 years are, are not uncommon. And we find a long tail of long lived protocols like Modbus um, and PLCs and RTUs are, are still out there for a very long time. So that's the problem. Um, how about we talk a little bit about what we see as a V bringing a, a solution to this problem? Um, you can capture very simply stop using the internet and um, don't assume that the answer to your connectivity challenge is to start with a connection to the public internet really we really need that um placing large numbers of unattended devices on the public internet will potentially end badly for you and your customers and um, mark short from canonical uh, the makers of ubuntu has a, a phrase he uses which is to stop building a liability and start building a business. In many cases, an industrial appliance or an IoT device will, will bundle connectivity or will bundle VPN and access third-party cloud or on-premises systems. You don't secure this. If you don't control this kind of commanding hype of the IoT, then it will potentially end badly for, for you and for your customers. What I want to talk about today is Azavi Passbridge. And Passbridge is our SDN technology, and it enables the declaration or the creation of private IP networks at a massive scale. We feel it solves a number of prototyping and rapid deployment. We also feel it embeds security at the network layer. And you'll see a theme throughout the slides where this is about trying to move security and control away from the edge nodes where it's difficult to do and centralize it in the network where it's a little bit easier to control and, and, and get a handle on, uh, on your security posture. So you might say, well, that's all very well. I'm going to tune out now because I need the cloud. Um, I, I, I need Amazon IoT. I need Azure IoT Hub. Um, that's okay. Uh, Amazon IoT is one of these partners. We're proud to count a number of cloud customer, uh, cloud vendors as partners of Amazon Passbridge. And the reason for that is because we help with the declaration of perimeter. We make it easier to consume cloud services by starting from a slightly more controlled or formally designed network. So if we start with a device that is on a network, but not the internet, then we can be a little bit more selective about how we consume the internet and do it on our own terms. 
So that might be something like um, connect your devices but allow only a certain TCP or UDP port to a specific destination. If you think about it, it's kind of crazy that a, a device that uses a, a service that might be hosted in the United States can resolve domain names anywhere in the world. And why is that the case? And why don't we take that capability away from the network connection? It's less about running a, a firewall on the device, although you should obviously do that. Um, but why would your IoT devices ever be able to resolve a or you domain name if that isn't part of their use case? And rather than putting a, a policy down onto the devices, uh, let's make it so that you can declare this policy in the network, making it easier to change or easier to percolate changes to devices later. Um, this is about taking an OT operational technology perspective versus an, an IT kind of permissive aspect. So into some, some, some block diagrams. Um, we see things on the right-hand side of this diagram. And first thing to know, we're, we're less interested in what the thing is than some other vendors. Um, we, we work very closely with Dell, who find their IoT gateways, the 3000 and the 5000, to be excellent. But there are situations where you need to use a Sierra wireless gateway or build your own Intel Quark or, or Atom or, or something else based solution or the ever-present Raspberry Pi. Um, we need to consume services that are maybe an Amazon, maybe an IBM, uh, maybe on-premises in VMware. And we can only do that if we have internet access. Well, the ASV approach is to allow for the creation of a network perimeter at the very early stages when you just have an idea. Um, and rather than having to reinvent the wheel, scale through idea, prototype, iteration, deployment, enable you to declare your network perimeter once, that network, and get all of the components that you could build yourself, but you might not know quite what your idea or your project is going to evolve into. So we can declare a radius or diameter capability, a PKI, a DNS server, virtualized policy and routing components, firewalls. This is a, a network factory into which you can plug in the carrier or carriers that you want to use and use our agents and our customized ISP services to connect your devices securely, if you wish, to the internet, or maybe keep them off the internet forever. So one network factory that makes the internet perhaps the next place you go, as opposed to the place you start. So a little bit more, more shape on that. Um, many of you will be familiar with using with cellular or LTE, um, and you may be familiar with getting a private APN from your carrier. A private APN is a core part of what Passbridge enables you to consume. It goes a, goes a lot further than that, but, but let's start with LTE because generally it's a, it's a well understood topology. Mobile operators are good at getting large numbers of devices natted or CG natted out to the public internet. It's relatively low value, it's a big pipe. And if you need to build a, a private APM, you need to answer a whole bunch of questions upfront and then manage those, uh, those connections uh, ever after. And if your project scales all over the world, then um, it, it becomes a little bit challenging. So Passbrick enables us to declare a private network and stand up a radius, a PKI, a DNS server um, immediately. Choose to start using Amazon Web Services without having made a, a big upfront commitment in network infrastructure, but add or swing around those connections to, to other cloud platforms or on-premises. This is very important when you see uh, IoT gateways where they evolve to run multiple applications on the one gateway. Uh, if you're in an industrial uh, or in, in an IIoT, the, the Internet of Important Things, um, you probably see situations where you deploy a gateway with a single application and then you need to run a second application on that device. That's not a, that's not a job for a second VPN client. It's not a job for a second SIM card. Passbridge enables you to turn that APN build into an API call, turn the VPN to cloud into an API call, 
and then move from a 500 device pilot to a 50,000 device rollout very, very simply. It's about making the network much more consumable. So ultimately, what does that look like? Um, well, we have LTE, we have LTE from multiple providers, maybe using services from Jasper, or even over the top. And um, we don't rule out the idea of bringing a device in over VPN, but we think it should be one of your options as opposed to your only option. Using our VPN API, you can declare a private network. And you get with it the alphabet soup of things that you, you could have built yourself, but building them yourself locks you into maintaining them ever after. And we take a very Amazon Web Services approach here, and Amazon has stickers they give out at their events, uh, friends don't let friends build data centers. And they're, and they're quite correct. Um, if you can avoid building dedicated infrastructure, um, you probably should. If you can make it so that you can make your network perimeter or capability malleable and make it as a service. Then as your, your project needs scale or flex or new requirements come in, you're not back to a reinventing the wheel each time. Then integrate with the endpoints you need to integrate to, and you have a single radius routing VPN and reporting capability across separate networks. Um, rather than having to reinvent the wheel each time you move into a new territory, you onboard a new carrier, or you bring in a different device type. So a couple of kind of concrete real world use cases here. Um, CCTV and security. Um, this, is a, this has been a big area for us. Uh, it was one of the first places where mobile communications were being used to connect field deployed devices. Using the API, a customer can declare their VRF, their virtual routing and forwarding capability, and they can declare a private static IP pool. Um, IMSIs or MSISDNs, these are the identifiers that mobile operators use to identify subscriptions. One of the party pieces inside Passbridge is the ability to leverage this security ecosystem. Uh, the SIM card, a lot of a lot of cost, a lot of expertise, and many eyes are on the security of the, the GSMA security services. And um, you may you, you have read certain things about, about potential attacks on that, but there's a there's a safety in numbers. And um, if you can leverage the the hardware device ID, the IMEI, and the SIM card, you get a great deal of security and um, in technical terms for free, uh, maybe not in cost terms. You can define a, a global username and password and define your VPN destinations. So what this means is you have end-to-end -end IP connectivity. You want to ping your devices on private static IPs. You want to declare or choose the IP addresses that you use, then you can do that. It's very important for somebody who's manufacturing connectivity into their device or trying to handle a, a post-shipping device lifecycle where they may not be able to change the config that they've bonded onto the, the firmware uh, on, the, on the device. Um, and this comes back to my, my comment about um, being able to consume part of the internet, but not all of it. Um, some of you will have tackled the challenge, which is moving from a traditional IP address ACL based system to a, a CDN. Um, many, many public services, Nokia, formerly Nokia here, Maps, uh, Google Maps, Spotify, uh, Google Location APIs, Netflix, you name it. Um, these services are behind content delivery networks. You don't securely access a given IP address. You resolve a domain which gives you your destination, and that may change um, fairly regularly. One of the things that Passport enables an IoT architect to do is to declare or describe what they want DNS to be for their devices. So for example, I want to resolve um, star.here.com. This could be honeywell.com, it could be schneider.com. This is not your only layer of defense, but it's a very powerful first line of defense to say, these devices should never resolve anything other than a .com domain or a .co.uk domain. 
And we can tie that in to a dynamic IPACL. This is something if you're an Amazon user, an AWS security architect, um, this is something that you can do to define the IPACLs using maybe a Lambda script. Um, you can, if you move your application or scale it across multiple data centers, this is something that you can, you can dynamically control. You can also do this mid-session. Um, if your session semantics change, if a device is believed to be out of policy, maybe it's making DNS lookups that it shouldn't be, being able to reach into the network and change or remediate at the network layer offers you a, an interesting line of defense. Um, zero implementation at the carrier, zero implementation at the device. This is a this is about a virtualized, intelligent network edge. We also see situations where there is a requirement to access uh, local breakout. And if you're shipping a device globally and you want the traffic to break out of an individual country, um, those of you lucky enough to have a Tesla, you might have noticed that uh, if you're Europeans, that your, your traffic may break out of a breakout in Spain, uh, meaning that you get Google in Spanish, uh, meaning that you get access to different radio stations potentially. Fast bridge capability enables you to embed your product with internet access, embed that product with control, and then mandate where that traffic will break out. This is about having an additional policy router at the edge of the, the carrier core. And my topic comes to my own heart, uh, automatic teller machines. Uh, ATMs, I suppose, were one of the, the original kiosk-based devices. Um, there's a I believe an ATM in Spitsbergen, uh, in the Norwegian territory of Spitsbergen, it's the most northerly ATM. And I'm told there is an ATM in McMurdo Station in the Antarctic. So they get everywhere. Um, they're deployed, they're forward deployed, they're in the field. We don't always have control over where they go. The only thing we can really be certain of is some level of electrical power. So having control over an ATM and not depend on the, the Windows XP or the Ubuntu or the Windows 10 ruggedized PC that is deployed um, is, a, is an advantage. So here we're using sensitive capabilities, declaring a private IP network, um, maybe declaring VPN tunnels, and using things like the hardware device ID as factors of authentication, not just to allow or deny, but also to drive network policy. So we've seen some very interesting use cases in, uh, in industrial IoT where devices go through a life cycle where the owner of a device may actually never see it. It may be shipped from Dell to a third-party systems integrator. That third-party systems integrator may ship it to an installer, but the actual owner may never see it. So handling device trust can, can be a challenge. Um, using PassBridge, we have a way of doing this one step removed from the device and controlling the static IP the device gets and what traffic it can access. It's also an ideal location to plug in um, extra analytic services and that's that's things that we're, we're working on at the moment. If we're going to automate all of the things, if there's going to be this, um, this new world of connected devices, um, Starting off with the internet is not necessarily the place that we want to go. Um, the carrier SIM can be treated a little bit like a, a client-side certificate. Um, it's just one of the things. Um, use, issuing a SIM from within the past for your infrastructure is also possible. But if your devices have a, a SIM card and a cellular modem, there's a lot that you can drive, a lot of value you can drive out of that that you, you may not be seeing the advantage of. One or two thank yous. Um, so I appreciate those. It's a it's a, it's an odd scenario speaking speaking to a laptop. Um, I've included my email address. Uh, those of you who want to reach out to me or find me on the the Intel dashboard, please do. Um, I'm always interested to talk about this stuff. I'm I'm not on the sales side of the house, so I promise I won't try and sell you anything. But if you are struggling or interested in discussing these kind of network plumbing challenges and I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to chat about that thank you very much everyone have a great day